Scott, you've been a promoter for a long time. Um, have you seen a submission like that before? You know, I, I never have seen a submission like that. The, uh, they call it, the new name is the Makia team. That's the first time for me. I, I mean, I've seen a lot of different cranks, and it, but it, was, it took me a second to figure it out. And I was talking to John McCarthy after. I said, John, did you see it coming? He said, I saw it coming. But I said, Josh Thompson, did you see it coming? He said, no, I, I didn't see it develop. So very slick move, man. Very, very slick move against a, a seasoned veteran that's, you know, our former champ, fought, been fighting for a long time. And uh, hats off to McKee. When we talked the other day, you talked about going into a uh, community center in California where you first met AJ. Is, is it kind of crazy as a promoter to sit up there now where you are and, and, and have a, a guy like him as your finalist? You know what? Um, something we're very proud of. I mean, I, you're right. AJ was a kid. I walked into a youth rec center in Orange County to see Rampage Jackson, actually. And AJ was there fighting the main event. His father was there. And AJ had a great great win he had a great submission i think that night and and won by submission and and he was an amateur fighter at that point and um you know we had a nice chat after and i said this guy this guy's got something he's got a little bit of swagger now he's got a lot of swagger but uh he's been doing great and and it just goes back to look i think that's something we're very good at better than anybody else a star identification and star building and now these kids are at the point where they can fight anybody and, and now he's fighting for a million dollars you know against the winner of sanchez pitbull so a lot riding on the line, and uh, I know that uh, everybody's going to ask me, and I might as well just bring it up. Time frame, look, I want to get that other fight done end of January, and then maybe February, end of March, we'll, we'll, we'll try to get this fight on, to get the finals on. Yep. In the co-main event, um, Jason Jackson kind of emerging as a, another contender that you have at the tippity top of your welterweight division. Uh, what did you think of his performance and win over Benson Henderson? Yeah, I mean, you know, he did what he had to do, and... Um, I think he had a dominant performance, in, in my opinion. And I always said, I think Benson is going to have his hands full in this fight because you can see the size difference. The minute they stepped into the cage, I can see a difference in the size. And I said, you know, he's going to fight an uphill battle now because, you know, Benson's really a 155er, right? And he took this fight almost as a favor for us because, you know, Lorenz Larkin was supposed to fight. And he, he got injured. Something happened. He couldn't fight. Benson stepped in on 30-day notice to take this fight. So I, I know he likes fighting at 170, but I think we're, we're going to have a conversation with him about staying at 55 because I think he's still a great fighter. I think he's tough. I think he's still got some gas left in the tank. We just got to give him the right opportunity. Yeah, so safe, safe to say back to 155. Yeah. That, that's my vote, right? 170 for him is too big, I feel, and it's, everything's going to be an uphill battle for him. Not that 155 won't, but at least the cards are the same, and it's, and it's not stacked against him at that point. Appreciate it. Keith Schillen. Hey, Scott, congratulations on an absolutely wonderful event tonight. Uh, my, my first question, similar to what I just asked AJ, you know, you ran Strike Force, you know, you had Ronda Rousey come with the ranks. You probably saw some unbelievable star potential in her. She became probably bigger than the sport itself. Do you see that in AJ? And what do you have to do as a promoter to make him, you know, grow as a star? You know what? I'll tell you, I've been in this business a long time and there's not any one formula to it. Either they have the swagger or they don't. Either they have that X factor or they don't. It doesn't mean they're not a great fighter. There's a lot of great fighters. But to be that, you know, cultural icon that, um, let's say, for instance, Kimbo Slice, right? Here's a guy that had all those backyard fights and people loved him, right? And he, and he, he had that X factor. People wanted to be around this guy. AJ is the same way. People want to be around this guy. You know, there's certain people that just people gravitate to. Ronda Rousey was was one of the one of the people that you know we had fighting a strike force that people gravitate. But you know what? Again, going back to star identification, star builder. You know, we have so many great young blue chip prospects in this league now, and we're starting to develop them and nurture them and see them grow. And uh, and I think that you know what it takes time. I mean, look how long it took AJ like five years to get to this point, right? Almost six years. So, you know, to his advantage, he was, you know, I think he was like 17 or 18 when we first started talking to him. And, um, you know, we're going to be out there, keep looking for the new prospects uh, and sign some free agents from time to time like we did with Corey Anderson. But as far as developing him from ground zero in Bellator to becoming a world-class level, AJ is the first one that I say that 
we had developed to that point. And now he's ready to fight anybody. And he's told you that himself. So um, based on his performance, you know, he, he deserves it. And he's fighting for a million dollars against the winner of Pitbull Sanchez, which is going to be another great fight. And that's why I love these tournaments, because, you know, tournaments build stars. And, per, and tournaments really challenge yourself and test yourself. So uh, hopefully we'll have a couple of dates for you guys here in the, in the near future. And uh, we'll let these guys get it on. Scott, speaking of stars, you love signing legends. You love signing stars. A really big legend is in the headlines today. And Silver was released from the UFC. He might retire, but he's also a free agent right now. Do you have any interest in bringing Anderson Silver into Bellator? You know, that seems like to be a common question today that uh, I've answered. But, you know, at the end of the day, look, I have a lot of respect for him. He's one of my favorite fighters of all time. He's, I think, one of the greatest fighters in the history of the sport. And, um, you know, I give my hats off to him, man. He had a great career. And he might continue to fight and, you know, continue to, you know, uh, compete. But I really love our roster. I love the things that we're doing here. I love the direction of the company. And that's what we're going to stay focused on. John Carlo. Hi, Scott. Uh, great event tonight. Uh, you brought up there about the Grand Prix building stars, and uh, you spoke in the past about wanting to do a women's Grand Prix. Is uh, that still the plan? And uh, just seeing of uh, the star making performance by AJ McKee, would you be uh, opposed to doing more than one Grand Prix in a year? I really like doing one Grand Prix at a time, you know. I mean, that's what I think should happen. I mean, it's like I can't, it kind of goes back to my roots when I was working for K1. They had a whole K1 tournament for the whole year. And then at the end, they had a Grand Prix finals. And I think for a weight class, that's it deserves to have that, you know, that uh, finale with one one champion and one tournament final and, you know, one big, big event. And that's really what we've been doing. So um, could they overlap? I'd really like to see them not overlap. Um, but, you know, we we do getting back to the question about 125 pound female division and also um, you know, we've been talking about the 135 pound men's division that really is, it's just been growing and growing and the talent level is just, you know, off the charts now. So, you know, it could be one of those two divisions. We haven't really decided yet, but um, you know, we'll probably figure that sometime after Thanksgiving. And also uh, like Benson Anderson moved up to 170. Uh, you notice the size difference there. Uh, would you be open to a 165 pound division? Like I know other promotions are opposed to that. Would, would you be uh, open to it? You know what? I tell you, uh, it's not that I would not be opposed to it. My thing is if we do it, I think all the organizations have to do it together. I think the commissions, everybody has to get on the same page. So you'd need a lot of people getting on the same page because it really, I think it really works the way it is right now. And, and that's kind of been, you know, and when I think about boxing, when I grew up, it was kind of like that as well. I mean, they had, you know, 145. They had one, I mean, sorry, they had like 132. Then they had, you know, 142 and then 155. I mean, they didn't have as many weight classes as they do today. And I think it makes it a little bit, you know, complicated and, and uh, hard to follow. So I think in boxing now they have every three or four pounds. It's, it's almost, it seems like a different weight class. But, you know, if we all got together as, let's say, a, a sport, of MMA and we all could get on the same page because I, I really think that's, that's the way it would need to be done. Donna. Hi, Scott. Uh, you're lucky you don't have to hand out performance of the night's bonnets, right? Because there was not one bad, uh, bad fight on this card. I guess maybe Jaleel Willis, Mark Leminger wasn't exactly Hagler Hearns, but otherwise every single fight tonight delivered. Yeah, listen, I think from top to bottom, we had some entertaining fights and it just kind of led up to and had a big crescendo at the end. And um, and last week we had another great fight card and the week before was great. I mean, I think we've been producing cons consistent, big, big fights here at the uh, Mohegan Sun. And, uh, and and I think CBS Sports is very happy with, with what we're doing here. And, uh, you know, people could, could watch the fights and it, it's live and free and we got the cbs sports uh, dot com airing the prelims as well as the uh, bellator youtube channel leading into the cbs sports uh network um you know for the big fights and it's working so to me i'm uh, very happy with uh with what we're doing here i think the fight quality has been superb outstanding it's just been unbelievable and uh, i'm excited i'm really excited about getting that next uh semifinals together quickly 
putting that fight in the cage as soon as possible, and then having the, the finals and giving away that million dollars to the winner of the tournament. I've asked you this question before, and I'm sure the answer hasn't changed a great deal, but uh, this, this Cyborg and Katie Taylor fight is the talk seem to be heating up a small bit. Eddie Hearn has, has been saying your name a little bit. Obviously, Katie had an unbelievable performance last week in, in, a, in a historic night at Wembley Arena. Have you had any more uh, discussions, any more reaching out from, from Eddie Hearn? You know what? Uh, I haven't talked to him since the last time. Uh, we, we were talking about, you know, three, four weeks ago and uh, going back and forth. Listen, like I said, why does it always have to be, you know, the uh, MMA fighter going to become a boxer? Why can't it be the other way around? That's one. But in saying that, if Cyborg really wants to fight her and she wants to go into boxing and, 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 and win a title and she wants to fight Katie, listen, we'll step aside and we'll let her get it on. But that's going to be up to her. So there's been, there hasn't been any further discussions. I think that we'll probably pick it up with Cyborg sometime after Thanksgiving, and then we'll figure it out. But, um, you know, we're, we're, we're not going to be the person stopping that fight from happening. We'll take a couple more. Jay? Thanks very much. Uh, <clears throat> Scott, great event tonight. A um, couple of quick ones for me. We spoke to Pitbull recently about his plans for the lightweight belt, and he basically said he'd have to check with the boss. Uh, that being you, have you had that conversation with him? Do you have a direction that you're leaning in? You know what? Um, because he is in the tournament, it's you know we kind of had to have, have we've, had, we've had to hit the pause button a little bit because you know before COVID hit in March, this tournament should have already been over, and he should have been defending his lightweight belt by now, right? So that that's that's unfortunate because you know it's just something beyond our control, and um, it, you know we just had a big big moment of eight months of really nothing to do with the tournament, and we just put it on pause. So. When I think about well, what could have happened, we, we got, you know, it's the, this fight could have already happened. But um, as far as getting Pitbull in there defending his lightweight belt, I think the tournament should finish and then we'll let him go. In the meantime, we're going to keep signing new fighters. We're going to keep uh, getting some free agents involved if, uh, when they're available. And we're going to keep building that 155 pound weight class. And, you know, we're going to get some guys to uh, throw it down for Pitbull. I did, I did get a message from his, um, his manager and said, you know, that uh, if his brother was in a title fight contention at some point in the fight or in, his, in, in the next, you know, several months as he's, um, you know, getting ready to compete again, the um, pit bull would step aside at some point maybe, or he would consider it because he's not going to want to fight his brother for the title. So if, if his brother is, you know, winning and looking good and getting ready for a title fight. I think the Pitbull brothers have a decision to make at that point. And, uh, you know, does that change your thought process in terms of an interim title? If the featherweight uh, Grand Prix maybe stretches on a little uh, longer than planned, maybe there's an injury. At what point do you consider that? You know, I'll tell you, I don't think so. I don't think right now at this point, when you're talking about November and the fight could be here in late March, I don't, I don't think that it, it, it puts a pause uh, in there and an interim title. I think that, you know, let's just finish this tournament. Let's, let's get it done. And then Pitbull will have a decision to make. Last one, Santiago. Hi, Scott. Greetings from Amsterdam and congratulations on a beautiful night of fights. A couple of quick ones for me. I heard you openly speak about wanting to come to Amsterdam and put a big fight here. What is it about Amsterdam that is so appealing to you? I mean... When you think about the history of martial arts combat, right, uh, some of the greatest fighters, at, at least in the striking part, some of the greatest fighters, if not, I would say 80 percent of them were all Dutch. So the, the Dutch understand, you know, the combat of, of martial arts, and I think they respect martial arts. And uh, even our Viacom counterpart there, he loves he loves kickboxing. He loves MMA. He trains himself and uh, he's a top executive at, at Viacom. And. And, um, you know, I, first time I had lunch with him, he had a black eye and, uh, he told me he does Muay Thai at the gym and, and he spars all the guys. And I mean, it's just part of the culture there. Um, and you know, Amsterdam has not had a MMA fight for a long time. And I think that we should be the one to do it. And I think we have the roster to, to, uh, to bring there. I mean, I think we got, you know, gig there and we have a bunch of great fighters and talent support from Viacom there. 
and uh, Viacom uh, Netherlands and Benelux really support us uh, heavily. So we would love to come there. And we've been trying. I mean, it's, you know, we were actually making a lot of headway with the government there until uh, COVID hit. So that kind of put a, a pin in it for a bit. But, you know, at one point, who knows when this will be finished as well as far as the COVID and we'll be back up and running and we'll be out traveling and we will go to Amsterdam for sure. And then last thing for me, Scott, Gegard Musasi wants to defend his middleweight title next against John Salter. And he wants to do that in Europe. He would prefer Amsterdam, of course. Would you entertain that specific fight for Gegard against Salter? And would you send him to Europe for his next fight? You know, the opponent we haven't uh, decided, but, um, you know, when I think about um, the location, really it depends. I'm not, we're not opposed to it, but, you know, whether we fight here with no audience or you fight in Europe with no audience, it, you know, it doesn't, there's, there's really, you know, no difference in my opinion. So to me, Gegard uh, traveling here is just the same as us going there because it's actually harder for us to go there because we have travel restrictions by all these countries that, hard to get in at least the other way around we can get Gegard to come here and we can get our fighters foreign fighters to come here and so we have uh that relationship with the government to uh, get these visas expedited for these foreign athletes but you know trying to go to milan and and paris was quite challenging listen we did a my team did a great job they got it done but uh it wasn't easy and paris was another situation we all had to have letters from the government you know, from the Ministry of Sport to invite us. And it's, it's a whole process of additional red tape that we don't have when the fighters come here. So depends when, you know, COVID is here or not here, when Gegard wants to fight again, that that's going to be a factor. All right. Thanks, Scott. Appreciate Thank it. Congrats. Another great night of.